Merry Christmas, Jim. You're fired. <laughs> yeah, that'd be messed up, dude. We are now entering the house of Mr. Peter E. Cole I. Psych. <laughs> Nothing to see here, is there? We are entering now New Almaden, named after the ancient and immensely rich Spanish mine. Almaden is an Arabic word, the mine. The Almaden mine in Spain was the richest producing mines in the world. Pliny the Elder, a fictional observer, claimed that the ancient Greeks obtained vermilion for decorative purposes from the cinnabar produced by the Almaden mine. The New Almaden mine is about 13 miles southwest of San Jose. The exact date of discovery? Unknown. However, the Indians are said to have used the cinnabar reduced to pigment for their war paint and other decorations long before civilized man became acquainted with it in 1824. At this point, the Robles family was informed of its existence and they thought it contained silver. They worked it for about a year and then they promptly gave up on it. 20 years goes by, Andres Castillero from Mexico starts experimenting with the ore, finds out it's a quicksilver mine, claimed the rights of discovery under Spanish and Mexican law. There was no judge of the first instance, whatever that means, available. So he founded a company, and he hired a guy named Billy Shard to construct furnaces, which didn't work, or so we're told. They were abandoned in 1846. Castillero sold certain shares to an English mining uh, operation, which tried to take possession of it with great success until 1850. A thriving town called Hacienda, which became New Almaden, arose, and at one point, the height of its prosperity, its production exceeded that of the original Almaden in Spain itself. So the New Almaden mine is the site of the first mercury deposit discovered on the American continent, it yielded metal of greater value than of any other mine in the state, producing nearly a third of the country's mercury supply. At the time, Quicksilver was the chief reduction agent for gold and silver, so it basically, perfect timing, made the uh, gold and silver quartz mining uh, possible. In 1927, they terminated it. It was resumed during World War II, but I believe it's inactive today. What you're seeing is some of the 1850s wooden and adobe structures and offices and mine structures that, and old furnace buildings that remain. Oh, at one point, it was owned by the Forbes Company. In 1847 and 1850, 807-foot tunnel constructed. There were earthquakes between 1852 and 1855, which destroyed many of the buildings. So they made front and side walls 13-inch thick in brick and 16-inch adobe. Then a man named Sherman Day, some Yale-educated civil engineer, showed up in 1857. He later became an original trustee of the University of California. And he began a new drainage tunnel that they called the Bull Run. They constructed a general store, 405 buildings in the next 40 years, furnaces, dwelling houses, workshops, stores, small workers' cottages, a Catholic church in the Mexican camp of Spanish Town, a prep school for Mexican children, a schoolhouse, a recreational hall, a Methodist Episcopal church in English Town, very original guys, and thusly became the richest quicksilver mining operation in North America. The town was renamed New Almaden in 1847. And I got some questions. Doesn't really seem like, uh... Hey, you made it! Who's she? This is some insanely thick building. Almost has Starfort quality to it. But many of these buildings seem like they have been through it. The old dust pile up. And that is Pollyanna. All I need is my guns and everything I kill with my guns in my house. Now get the fuck out. And get the fuck out we did. Hold on, I forgot to mention something. Look. Got those two little walls in there. I'm gonna point them out every freaking time. Figure out what they are. It might even be Mercury. From the very mine itself. Here's two more. And we got some stalactites here. Mites crawl up, tights fall down. That's your mnemonic device. This looking really very complete. And look at the earth here. It looks like this whole hill has shifted and the ground has risen up and just pushed this house out. I mean, it looks like it just came to a stop there. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just saying that's what it looks like, right? Subterranean layer. Built in 1854. Designed by Gordon Parker, Cummings, Henry Halleck. The two-story brick building was originally covered up with stucco, scored to simulate masonry. Now, only the first floor remains. They constructed a lake nearby. James Butterworth Randall completed extensive improvements. Oh, it's been a club, a restaurant, a prostitution hall, and most recently, an apartment company. Personally, I feel like it's prostitution hall years where it's finest, but... The Mine Hill School. Redwood structure, 1880s. The first school built to accommodate the workers for 30 years. The largest of the three schools and the only one still standing. It is, we're assured, the most architecturally sophisticated structure on the hill. And the whole area looking very uncertain. Well, the miners had this many kids, huh? And they all fit in that building. Okay. And that is awesome. These are some old boat down miners' cottages. This was built for Fremont and Cora Older, 1913. 
Designed by Wolf and Wolf. Fremont Older, a prominent figure in the history of San Francisco journalism. In other words, a deep state actor. Better known for his anti-establishment crusades, all a ruse, no doubt, and occasional sensationalist newspaper stories. Cora Baggerly, also a journalist, wrote for Bay Area newspapers and published many monographs on local history, so we know she's a liar. After her death, the place was heavily vandalized and threatened by destruction. So well-loved, I see. No one really knows who built it. Some people argue that it was probably Julia Morgan, the first woman to graduate from Paris École des Bois. But the Wolf family, particularly Mr. Wolf of San Jose, is mentioned as the contract. Wolf family moved from Greenville, Ohio to San Jose. For the next 10 years, he would design and build a house, supervise the construction, move his family into the completed structure, and then while the missus landscaped the lawn and furnished the interior, he would begin constructing a second house. When that residence was built, they would sell the one they were in and move into the new one. Apparently, they did this again and 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 again for the next 10 years. When finally he had a reliable practice and his family's nomadic lifestyle was no longer necessary, joined by Charles McKenzie, Wolf and McKenzie became a thing. Then just like that, they were working on things like high schools, hospitals, apartments, condos, hotels, commercial structures. Federico Quintero, an Italian mason, designed the terrace and rock walls. And all of this very suspicious. Why? Here we find ourselves at a seminary. Allegedly constructed in 1926 for Roman Catholic missionary order with missions in China. This is why there's elements of Chinese architecture, as if there were no people from China around. They had to build this for a missionary group who had been to China and just sort of told them about it. Mystery architects just knew how to flare the roofs like this despite this not being common in America. They claim that there are Buddhist candlesticks inside. And it's a retirement home for missionaries now. Here, the four-pronged electric tower and other random decorations that no one has a need for that serve no purpose but are universally loved and admired. In other news, and a bunch of little random white picket fence houses of America here. This is an auto camp. See, as the story goes, these are the precursor to hotels. Our love affair with the car that I believe was heavily pushed upon us really stems around, you know, the fact that you can take a road trip, you can tour. Before World War II, automobiles were primarily recreational, so they didn't have all these roadside services and food stands and gas stations and hotels. And they camped by the side of the road. They slept in their car or slept in the tents. They cooked over their little campfires. And it wasn't until like 1920 that the first public and private campgrounds even began to sh appear with basic stuff like, you know, bathroom and laundry and... And good company. So these camps would have big old-fashioned family reunion base. 1925, though, California, you got all these entrepreneurs who started making these cabin camps. Like these little shacks with wood instead of dirt floors and a couple restrooms and all that. 50 cents a night. Might even be a mattress or some chairs. Maybe even a toilet. And this is an example of one of the early ones. This has the looks of and the, let's see if I'm correct, small town Carnegie Library. Now it's a museum which used to be just in the basement. I say now, but I'd say that was as of 1975. And of course, being a library, it's got all the fanciest architectural flares of the day. Roman Doric entrances, porticos with pediments, and tablatures with denticulated cornices, paralleled roof parapets, arched entrance, triple windows, yata, 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 ta, ta. Now these here beautiful buildings belong to the dairy farmers. As the story goes, for most of these dairy farmers in this era, you got Spanish and Mexican settlers raising stock, but the cows are really only for, they only milked them for when they had calves. It wasn't until, of course, the 49ers showed up from the old Northwest and Middle Atlantic states that Suddenly, milk became a thing. Like the whole country just transformed overnight in 1849. 1850, you got Santa Clara Valley cheeses appearing. Ten years later, the federal census shows 7,300 cows producing 222,212 pounds of butter and 181,105 pounds of cheese. Exactly. Not, a, not an ounce more. And by 1876, half a million pounds of cheese in Santa Clara up until the 20s. So this particular dairy farm, Rodney Eichenberg. Mr. Eichenberg came to the gold regions in 1849. Had middling success, but enough to finance the purchase of 343 acres of farmland. Him and all his neighbors turned to dairy. Barnes, heavy redwood timber, we're told, may indicate a much earlier date of construction. Well, what a controversial statement. And this here is a beautiful Victorian home called the Hink House. Built around 1890, stands an example of prosperity acquired through agriculture and sits alone in its rural setting. The last holdouts, you see. You'll see, we're coming for you. This here was the old, old creamery. First butter factory in Gilroy. 1908. Look how charming. This is what they're calling a wooden tank house. 
Erected in 1906, it's a four modern irrigation, pressurized spring water. This here is one and a half story. I wonder what the other half is. <laughs> Heavy redwood timber frame, Christ Episcopal Church. That pipe organ, though. The architect of this place was a man named Ernest Coxhead. Mr. Ernest Coxhead was born in 1863. He received his architectural training as an apprentice of the English architect George Wallace and later Frederick C. Chancellor. In the early 1880s, there's that n number again, he was enrolled as a student at the Royal Academy of Art and attending classes at the Royal Institute of British Architects. He won a silver medal for drawing, 1884, which had been his 20th birthday. Came first to Los Angeles from Britain in 1886, designed a few churches there. After four years, he moved to San Francisco, the leading figure in the development of the Bay Area. Then, presumably, when they ran out of churches to claim they built, they started pulling the old trick of blowing smoke up the arse. Talking about the small-scaled wooden structures are so lovely. Their anti-urban, domestic image, picturesque in their sensitively landscaped settings. Cox had himself loved the churches, high-valued chambers, and long, narrow gallery. This building, although it looks very Asian, I love the use of these inside. Repurposed Spanish missions, we're told. One almost begins to get interior building fatigue. Gina and Rod. Ooh. Oh my god, you made Jimmy sick. Blah, 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 Edelweiss, Edelweiss. Palo Alto, Old World Wonder, was built in 1985 by Pedro de Limos. He was a graphic artist, a director of the Stanford Art Museum, and the editor of the School Arts Magazine, an eclectic Spanish colonial revival commercial structure. Enhanced with the courtyard, trees and shrubs, Pedro de Limos also will get you out of your locked car. So what do you think of that? <laughs> I'm sure that's, and that's original to the building for sure. Did not come in later. Don't care, not listening. And this is the Andrew Landrum House, 1875. He was a noted carpenter, designed his new home from pattern books he saw in the corner stores. This is in its original condition and is a landmark. I saw pictures and knew how to make it, huh? I mean, okay. They really are just running out of creativity, aren't they? These are the Harrison Street houses, the oldest continuous block of houses in the city of Santa Clara, which have not been significantly altered. First ones made on the block, a picturesque and harmonious streetscape. The brackets, the ornamentation, why it reflects the heyday of intricate millwork and the influence of pattern books. This block was always considered to be one of the finest, where the leading merchants and tradesmen lived. It's retained its integrity. German immigrants were among the earlier settlers in Santa Clara. They believe it was built in 1818. Definitely looks old enough. But that's it. They don't tell us anything about it other than that. 1818. There's a drawing. An even better drawing. And even better. There's a map in case you're lost. You are here. An even better drawing. Done by this guy. Who, if you ask me, needs a much taller top hat if he wants to become noticed in this town. That's better. And, um, what people used to wear. I, for one, would like to return to that model of dress. Incredible buildings. Here's the Mission Santa Clara. Note that... These here floors are dirt. The roads are dirt, yet we have this. For what? This is just incredible interior, my god. A bunch of very, really non-American themed stuff. Bunch of wizards up here calling you up. Oh, I see. Let me guess. This is supposed to be a great fire. Now, I guess this could be a picture, but um, that, that, that is smeared ink. They're just simply smearing ink upwards and pretending this is smoke and fire, really. Fire burns sideways like this, huh? Or just, it's just exploding out the sidewall. No, no, no. This is still hand-drawn. This, you can see fingerprints. This is all just smeared. It's just smeared ink. Right here, it, it burned through in a clean, straight line. We're all the way to the rafters. And next to it is just fine. What a joke. Here, too. And then it's... Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. All so helpless. Such victims. Oh, no, 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 no. And then just like that, it's covered in plants and abandoned. What a shame. But guys, you know what? We will be all back better. Oh, we're back. Oh, it's time with a new logo. We call it the Pyramid Sunny Happy Guy. Who's not watching you ever? Cool name, huh? That's gorgeous. I believe that to be electric light. Curious how they ran those wires. Curious what that is. Curious about all of it. Ah, of course. Masonic Temple and Bonanza 88. It's like this place was just designed by evil people. Who chased all the good people out of here. This world was not built for you, demons. You should go find something better to do. The Emily Horn House, built in 1906. It was threatened in 1976 by the ever-expanding orchards around it. 
did it make it? Dun, dun, dun. Find out next time. Or don't. Oh, let me guess. Um, an observatory. You're correct. Mount Hamilton, the Lick Observatory. Since 1888. This is that number again. Uh, God, I feel like a broken record. Good old Jimmy Lick. Mill owner and real estate entrepreneur. Then he just fucked around and built an observatory. Well, yeah, naturally. That's what I do, and I'm bored. I just make insanely complex buildings that I never had training for. Now, what you guys do? This here is the Howard B. Gates House. It's the only example of the work of the noted California Bernard Maybeck. Dramatic staircase. Oversized fireplace. These are the characteristics of Maybeck's favorite things. Built for Dr. Gates, whose name I hate, in 1904. No further questions, Your Honor. No further comments, either. Now, this here is the Winchester House. Extraordinary structure. Structured over a period of 38 years because the owner, the heir to the Winchester Rifle Kingdom, Sarah Winchester, believed she would live as long as construction continued. The house contains 160 rooms and covered six acres. Some of the 40 stairways and 2,000 doors led nowhere. Do we even dare venture forth? No. Look at that, mother. That's one house. It's got a maple paneled ballroom with pipe organ, of course, a white satin chamber, a patchwork of trap doors, crooked halls, steps leading nowhere, doors opening into space, 40 stairways twisting and out, up and down, 2,000 doors open at unexpected places, thousands of windows. It's a rifle museum, a wax museum, a garden exposition. This stuff is old world. Look at these patterns here. Look at these things here. Interesting. This is a griffin. This is Via Montalvo, built from the designs of the noted San Francisco architects Curlet and Gotts Chalk. Landscaped by John McLaren, the home of the region's greatest philanthropist, James Duval Filon, mayor of San Francisco and U.S. Senator. Oh, so benevolent. One of the most visually stunning residential complexes in Santa Clara. Oh, yes. The creepy baby is beautiful home. The Dunbacon House. The well Dunbacon House, if you get my hate. And there is zero information about the Dunbacon, Dunbacon House. House. And whether or not you believe in the theories that there were events that happened that shaped our history that we know nothing about. For the very skeptic-minded who, who downplays any mud flood or any previous civilization, I'm curious if they can, if you can honestly ask yourself to explain these architectural drawings here, 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 this whole thing. And tell me that this does not look like a very obvious case of the ground level rising up and covering a large majority of these buildings. Can you honestly tell that, tell yourself that? This building should extend down to at least here, just keeping with symmetry. These windows, same. Should be going down, down, down here. Maybe ending here. Something like that. Same here. This is why these houses have basements, okay? This is not, not because they thought it was easy without power tools or steam shovels, remember? Only one was delivered to San Francisco in 1852. One steam shovel. It's not enough to do all these buildings. It's the only thing that makes sense. And logically, it's the only thing that passes the eye test. This is straight from the National Survey. It's unavoidable. And so the question is, how is it that there's an event that flooded all these buildings in every state, all over the world really, but let's stick to the United States for now. All over the United States, every building built between a certain time period has this feature. That implies two things to me. One, that not only does the possibility exist that we don't know our own history. But number two, the possibility and the probability that the power exists to keep this information from us. That there's a, some structure somewhere in place that holds this, withholds this information. Because someone knew. Someone dug these buildings up. Someone knew. Someone was there before they, uh, someone was there to build them in the first place. So if you have to accept this as reality, because it is, then you have to open your mind to the possibility that there's a vast conspiracy. So large, it can pretty much deceive the entire human population. And that is the starting point for which you can systematically rid yourself of some of the illusions. The illusion being that our life is not an illusion. And these little drawings alone are full of such little oddities like this cellar plan inaccessible inaccessible presumably still filled with dirt but they don't say they're not there here you go again building should look like this this door is just this little entry hall or whatever it's just tacked on it's not part of the original building it doesn't even hide it it's not part of the building chances are these people didn't build this if they had they had to build the door the way they wanted it to here you go again it should look like this here you go again it's just i mean here you go again look at they even drew this here 
They drew this part themselves. Look at that. They even wrote original building. Look at that. Because they know. That's incredible. I'm telling you right there. Here you go, Gan. These are the Watts Towers. Well, first of all, in this survey, there's no information about them. Zero. Just a name and a photograph. But allegedly, these are part of an artist's uh, property in Watts, California. A bunch of towers, structures, designed and built by Sam or Simone Rodia. From 1879 or 1886 to 1965. A mason, like a tile mason, not a Freemason. Although we're told he was a period... Oh, Jesus. Never mind. He's an Italian immigrant, construction worker, and a tile mason for 33 years. Yeah, there's that number again. Uh, not his whole life, just 33 years. Okay. It's an example of outsider art. I mean, to me, they look electric. Or like to transmit some signal, but... Allegedly, Watts, born in Italy, immigrated to the U.S. when he was 15. His brother died in a mining accident. He moved to Seattle. Found a wife. Moved to Oakland, 1902. Divorced a few years later. Moved to Long Beach. Started making these towers in 1921. No one knows his real name was Sam or Sabatino or Simone. Simon. He's allegedly one of the people on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band album. And makes all this stuff out of found artwork. I found uh, found items. Working alone with hand tools. Children bring pieces of broken pottery to him. And he used railroad tracks as a makeshift tie. Got tired of fighting with the L.A. for the permits. And at one point he fell off one of these towers and left. Then magically his bungalow inside the enclosure was burnt down as a result of an accident on the 4th July. And the city of LA condemned his structure in order to be destroyed. Uh, f uh, there was an actor that purchased the property from his neighbor for $2,000. That's it. To preserve it. Jesus. And so somehow this filmmaker had uh, raised enough popularity and opposition from around the world to the demolition of it that they had to have a, uh, an engineer come out and he concluded... But the towers were capable of withstanding lateral force of up to 10,000 pounds, meaning that there's no way that they were going to be demolished like that. And so there they stand. Now they are owned by the City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department. Yeah, the whole thing just seems a little bizarre. A lot of people back in the day were uh, very fond of those towers. Charles Mingus, jazz artist, and they've been s featured in movies and TV shows. But to me, there's something odd about them. It looked like some of them might have been there for, for some time before our Italian friend. Stanford University, founded by the aforementioned mentioned Leland Stanford, insanely wealthy robber baron. The first president was David Starr Jordan, who was a well-known eugenicist, published many books on the subject matter, who was a member of the Bahamian Club and the Sierra Vista Club and other dubious organizations, president of the World Peace Foundation, board of trustees for the Human Betterment Foundation, even though they advocated compulsory sterilization. This is the first president of Stanford. He's also the guy that covered up the poisoning of Jane Stanford, Mr. Leland Stanford's wife, although they hid that, or they kept that story hidden for 70 years. And the whole area, designed by William Homestead, the guy that did several of the world's fairs. So it's a who's who of deep state players. And it's a remarkable series of buildings, I should say. Tacky clock just sort of attached to the outside. Looks ridiculous. Extremely opulent place. Get your Torah here. Various other symbols we've come to expect. Fantastic little old world sconces and... Some of this looking like it's been redone or freshly done in fresh plaster. You see the grooves from the trowel here. Many of these buildings allegedly destroyed by the 1906 earthquake, even though this is, what, 50 miles away from San Francisco? But quite a place. And of course, very necessary for a school. Very necessary for any university to have these things. Allegedly a blend of uh, Greek revivalism and Spanish revivalism with the red tiled rooftops that so befitting of a California town. And this is a castle. I don't care what you say. No way around it. Castle. This is just a church for college students, huh? I'm sure they need this. This is absolutely stunning. And completely beyond the means of these people to make something like this. It is really pretty ridiculous. The, apparently, the Stanfords chose their country state, the Palo Alto Stock Farm, <clears throat> as the site of the university. So they, <laughs> jokingly, and still to this day, refer to it as the farm. <laughs> Not because they're like, you know, <laughs> like because it's like, you get it? So, of course, you have uh, Stanford bringing the president of MIT out here, Francis Walker at the time, also a eugenist, and uh, the Boston firm of Shepley, Rutan, Coolidge, come out of the Henry Hobbs and Richardson as in the Richardsonian Romanesque style uh, of that ilk. And it's just a who's who of uh, a bunch of elite, potentially uh, fraudulent characters. I mean, and this isn't really about uh, the people of Stanford. I too much is supposed to be out the building. So some of the more interesting parts uh, as pertaining to the things that we look at in these. Let's take a little look here at the area. Uh, there's a couple things that come to mind here as we approach this from the aerial view. Wow, that is a lot of houses. Damn. I don't expect everyone to watch every video I've ever made, of course. There's a series that I've been doing, kind of plodding along, distracted really with this one, where um, I'm, I'm touring Star Forts, and I know that's a, that subject matter is kind of beat, but it's more of a little bit of a... Um, a light dive into some of the towns surrounding these these structures, colloquially known as Starforts. 
But there's a few things that I notice in the land from these upper views that are just recurring patterns time and time again that I call like an old world grid. And it seems to be this detailed layout of uh, architecture and roads and parking lots and football fields and etc. And this right here, this Stanford campus, checks all the boxes for what I would call suspicious. You have things like this, things like this structure here, the way it's aligned with domes like this and like this, repurposed as they are, the underlying structures are still there. And the grid is still there. As a matter of fact, and this one's got it all. I mean, you've got your little oval here. This right here is what I would call the strip. Yeah, multiple ovals. And I know these are often repurposed as sports arenas or um, running tracks. There at one point was a lot of water that there's not anymore. Lake Lagunita. I mean, not much of a lake anymore. <laughs> I would say it's dry patch Lagunita. There's even a golf course, which the rolling mounds and the sand traps of the golf course are very suspicious. And not to mention the fact that the Pentagon manages a large number of the golf courses around the world, which is very suspicious. The hell does the Pentagon have to do with golfing? Siphon off of the water to, you know, give it to this. <laughs> I mean, the amount of homes in this area is just absolutely insane. Look at them all, just painted on for miles and miles. Pretty nuts. Interesting tunnel, wonder where that comes out. There's a the little observatory. Uh... <laughs> I don't know what that is. You know, another thing that's kind of curious is they claim that... a sculpture garden here. They claim that San Francisco earthquake damaged a lot of these buildings. But, I mean, this place is like 50 miles from San Francisco. So, I don't know. Interesting shape of that lake. Looks like a phoenix. In any case, an interesting little tidbit about it that... One of the popular things to do there at Stanford that you simply must do while you're there... Uh, is to go steam tunneling. Steam tunneling is the exploration of the intricate and numerous labyrinth of brick line steam tunnels that are underneath Stanford University where they used to apparently pipe heat in. This is the same story that they tell at a Arizona State University where all of those are those are pretty much locked up for the most part. And it's starting to look like every university has these major has these tunnels uh, for steam. <laughs> I suppose what they refer to is it's like it's just the conduit. But why would they make them so large? I I don't know. There's just something odd about those that is worth looking into. And maybe I'll get around to it one day. Oh, uh, who am I kidding? Let's just do it right now. So this is end station three, where um it's some sort of underground station in the engineering campus. No windows, weird warning signs, um, and it's a football field sized room with uh, cranes and weird pipes and wires. And you can see down in here, there are tunnel entrances, underground facility it's called. There are apparently unmarked tunnels, escape tunnels that run under the street into uh, parking garages. The official story of this thing is that it's uh, supposed to be uh, a housing or a, a space for a large hadron collider that uh, they unplug the experiment, basically. But, I mean, come on, man. But, really, there are steam tunnels at Rice University, UC Berkeley, I mean, and really looking quite old world here. And I doubt that they were initially... Oh, well, they might have been for steam. I mean, who knows? I'm sure they were for um, whatever, whatever they used to use to... Whatever tech they used to use to power these buildings. You know, this all just adding to the narrative here that things are not as they appear. So, back to the survey here. We come to this item. Frenchman's Tower. Now, in the survey, there's nothing about this tower, other than the name itself. But the official story is that it was built by someone whose name is either Pauline Caperon or Peter Kautz, who moved to Mayfield in 1875, uh, and then basically in 1882 vanished back to France without telling his neighbors where he went, so how he went there, I guess, is a mystery, how they knew that. And he uh, liquidated his property, and this was uh, something he had allegedly constructed on it in 1875, similar to medieval fortifications, but built hundreds of years earlier, we're told. Second floor to water tank, first floor is a library. The building never had any doors, allegedly, and they required uh, entering through these windows which just seems ludicrous. The owner had these boarded up to avoid vandalism. But the man was uh, apparently mystified his neighbors and went by a different alias, and apparently there's rumors of tunnels that connect to it. There's even a um, CBS uh, report with Ken Bastida, who interviewed a local historian named Steve Steger, who says he doesn't believe that it was a water tower, because it's too far away from water or the rest of the property, so he's uh, this guy offers a reward to anyone who helps solve the mystery. Uh, I don't know if anyone did. And there's a whole backstory about the guy that built it. Uh, he had born of wealthy parents. Uh... The son of one of Napoleon's officers lost both his parents when he was 26. Founded a private bank. Founded a private bank, which he sold in 1873 and left France 
because of problems. Used fake identity papers and went to San Francisco. Uh, bought this ranch for $90,000. His he, Apparently his wife was an invalid. And so he took title to the land and he put in the name of his children's governess, someone named Eugene Clanson. And he developed the land into a stock farm, built this tower, would not discuss his past, and uh, people were very suspicious of him. <laughs> right, and rightly so. So Queen Anne Beauty's named the Griffin Drell House. And there is no further information. Quite the looker though. This is the Lee Henry Hoover house in Santa Clara. And there's virtually no information about this house either. But it is a mansion. And looking like it's all been stuccoed over at some point. Wouldn't be surprised if this was all brick. And yeah, this is a uh, dueling pianos, huh? Wow, what a place. My god. There you have a very interesting elevation here. This is the Palo Alto Winery. And there's no further information about this in the uh, survey. I'm assuming it's the same owner, but who can tell? I feel like they're terrible at their documentation on this. Again, this one, no information. Hey, little girl, what the hell are you doing out here? Santa Cruz Mission, built, mm, they think 1835, and they've added some things over the years. Uh, this is just bizarre. And yeah, sure, a weird old graveyard here on the property. It's disappointing that they are so shrouded in mystery, or just laziness, I guess. This is why when they suddenly go off for 20 pages on some backstory, it's highly suspicious. Again, this one, no information. Mm -hmm. Old chicken floor, eh? You won't catch me staying in this cabin pack. The hell is this? No man's land? That's weird. Mark, we get a bigger screen in here? What? Also, Jimmy ripped out my air duct. And here's my collection of trail signs I've been stealing over the years. <laughs> yeah, that's not suspicious or anything. Then they're gonna show you some old ass wood structures, like as if it's the same thing. What is that? And this is the city of Shasta, or what's left of it. Not much, huh? I mean, I'd like a beer, but very bizarre. What could have happened here? To make such big ass structures just be abandoned. This is the courthouse. Huge doors. And just just done. Just just walls. There's your old Masonic Hall. And uh looking like water at some point went through here. Probably rerouting it. It's probably would crush this place. There might be a few people that still live there. And here we are in Downey. Kinda more of the same. Vintage uh sort of wood buildings next to these old brick ones. But it's very wooded and it seems very nice. And it also seems very strange, like that. And this is a bit interesting. This is the uh, Benicia Storehouse. That's right. Now you might see a four-pronged shower, like it's a church, but it's not. It was erected in 1859 as a fortified storehouse. Fortified storehouse, huh? So they claim that they know the when it was uh, erected because there's an inscription on the building. They claim that it was, uh, as far as I can tell, it was designed by Commander F.D. Calendar and a master builder named J. Fuss. Mm -hmm. The letters make it clear that Calendar had a lively personal interest in the building's design. And they say there's an abundance of documentary material about this stored at the National Archives. S things such as letters from Calendar writing to Colonel Craig suggesting that the pressing need of the arsenal was a new storehouse for $50,000 to make this happen. And this is allegedly the destruction that it faced. Uh, oh my god, I can't believe I just said that. Here we have St. Augustine's College, Benicia, Solano, Col, Hala, Hala, Hala. In case you guys can't read, because I can. My mama taught me that shit. Uh, excuse me, young man, where are your pants? And let me just point out something that may not be obvious. And I swear to all the gods that I had not nothing to do with it. But these little prancing stick men? <laughs> like, from whence did they come? They're like, onward, boys, follow us in the parade. Da -da -da. And these guys are like, who the fuck are those guys? And this guy over here is like, oh, look at it, I stepped in some dog do. And uh, I didn't draw these. And I want to just say, like, this guy doing the headstand on the uh, cross. I don't know who did. I don't know if that's, they, they were just vandalized back in the 1800s before... This picture was scanned in, or if there's some new vandalism, but I, I just, man, that's hilarious. That is hilarious. Whoever did this, whatever generation you're from, whatever century, man, we are like kinfolk. You know what I'm saying? I would have did the same thing. Look at this guy over here, he's like a dead man. How funny. These little kids are like, Mom, do you see the ghost? And like, quiet down, Laura Lou. She's like, but for real. Come on, guys, let's go this way. We know the way, yeah. And these guys are like, the fuck? <laughs> I love that so much. God, it's the simple things in life, you know? It's like the, you know, the cup of hot tea and a cool day, you know? The friendly smile of a friend you haven't seen in a while, you know? It's like the, uh, the defacing of a historical document with little stick figures when you least expect it in the middle of a dry survey about the historical lies told to us by our forefathers! 
I don't know, you pick one. Which one makes you happy? I choose stick figures. Now you go. Well, let's see who wore it best. Bong, bing, bing. Yay. All right. Now, this one looks old. That one looks younger. That one looks younger still. No, actually, that one looks like it's kind of in the middle. But what's the real story? Well, this one's obviously the oldest, meaning it's the youngest building. By that, I mean, this is the oldest building picture. But at the time of the photograph, the building was the youngest, right? Wrap your head around that riddle. So then why in the youngest picture does the building look the oldest? You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't look like fresh construction. That looks like fresher construction, but it can't be. So at some point it looked like this and they trimmed it back, right? It's going back or whatever. And uh, this one is probably when it's at its prime. This one is probably more closer to now because as you now it's on its decline, you know, the paneling's falling off. Although certain things are better, like the railings. And it's interesting how this is gone. And now there's a chimney here, and I don't know that's part I don't think that's part of the same building, that thing. Very peculiar. Look at that. So many electric lines. Barely any. These look fake up here. Maybe not. I don't know. And this is even a different one. It can't be the same one, can it be? That's the same one? It's the same building. What the frick happened to the rose window? Hold on, I gotta know more about this. So many mysteries of our time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, my name is Whisper Jack, and what we do here is we recklessly speculate on all the things that we don't know that we know, or the things that we thought we knew that we don't know, or the things that we now know that we now know are not true. Most of everything you know is wrong. Fact. Most of everything you know is right is wrong as well. So what's right? No one knows. But in these dark times, with our little pen light of truth, we wander around this darkness and we recklessly speculate. We postulate on the imponderables. We ruminate on the remedial. Laughs are laughed, jokes are told, mistakes are made, cycle repeats. If you think I should have saved that for the beginning, well, I did. I just changed the definition to the word beginning to mean the middle. Are you beginning to understand? Because I'm not. Really, I was just stalling time here while my uh, my robotic assistant booted up. Are you ready, Cleo Glorg? <laughs> Cleo Glorg, speak to me. All right, what we have here is the Benicia State Capitol. I don't know why it says State Capitol. But whatever. This is a Greek Revival style brick and sandstone structure serving as the state capital between 1853 and 1854. Oh, so for one year's time. Thereafter, the structure remained the Solana County Courthouse until 1858. And sometimes it was a city hall, sometimes it was a public library, sometimes it was the fire department, sometimes it was the grammar school. You see how they're all interchangeable? In addition to housing many informal civic functions, it was thoroughly restored by the state in 1956 and has been maintained since then as a museum, of course. Notice, none of them ever become a sandwich shop. And don't tell me it wouldn't make a good sandwich shop. What do you know, sandwiches? And so, yeah, I see here the original photograph and restored. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see, um, kind of. I mean, you took out the stone things and you put in wooden ones again, which I guess was more like the original. Oh. Oh, gentlemen, you all left your hats. I'm going to play a joke on you guys. I'm going to switch your hats all around. <laughs> Benicia State Capitol. You're damn right. What else can you tell us about this here capital, sir? Well, let's see. What have I learned? What I've learned is it was erected in 1852. The building was constructed extremely quickly. According to city council minutes, the decision to construct the building was made on August 23rd, 1852. Bids were opened September 27th. By early January, it was finished in three months. Three months to build this in 1852. Let's see you top that modern contractor. You can't. <laughs> you can't. Because we couldn't either. Aww. Apparently, S.A. Ryder and J. Franklin Houghton were the contractors from San Francisco, of course. No one's from San Francisco in 1856, by the way, since no one lives there. But okay, by way of San Francisco, let's say. The plans were ex presented and explained by Mr. Ryder. And a week later, the plans were again presented by a Mr. Ryder. This time he brought along a Mr. Houghton. The city subsequently advertised for bids based on these plans. The low bid was that of Ryder and Hofton, who were also the only two people at the meeting, apparently. And they also did the actual construction. So, um, it seems highly likely that a member of their office designed the building, and then a member of their office uh, built the building, and the, their office has two members, and it's them. Now, the city of Benicia deeded the land to the state of California in 1853 on the condition it would be used for the state capital. The governor at the time, John Bigler, appointed to supervise the building of the city hall, etc., etc., etc. Stone foundations, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, according to long-standing local tradition, a part of the wood for the construction of the building was taken from old ships abandoned at the harbor. Because, you know, every harbor just has old ships abandoned at them. What? This was at least partially confirmed during the restoration when it was found that the Senate chamber columns of New England cider were originally ship's masts. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. Empty ships, empty buildings that you built in like a month. 
Why? It's just topsy turvy world because I'm pretty sure today, I mean, it's what, 2022? And a little sewer pipe broke out by the freeway, apparently, that no one knew about. And it took them six fucking months to dig up this road and replace. Uh, a four foot section of pipe? Six months. But yet, these guys are throwing up shit like this in three months with like donkeys and ropes and maybe a candlestick. Something don't add up, America. Something don't add up. And no, this is not a horse that I get tired of beating. I don't care how dead it is. The 50s, they, by the 50s, they say the building was in very poor condition. 100 years later. The brick, like much early local brick, had not been properly fired and was very soft. It had crumbled. The sandstone foundations had crumbled badly. Already in the 1885 bird's eye view, a number of tie rod anchor places are visible. By the time this is 70 years after that. Maybe it can't be saved, they wonder. Senator and State Engineer Frank Johnson reported there may be buildings in use for human occupancy in as poor structural shape as this building, but in my experience, I've seen no worse. The building has been so weakened by neglect that very little factor of safety remains. Therefore, you need to give us $230,000. Uh, Mr. Frank, I'd like to direct you to every other building in this survey. While there are some that withstand the test of time, that's true, Mr. Frank. I'd say that there are definitely, at least by my guesstimation, a lot of buildings that are in much worse condition, which is something that you're in trying to insinuate can't possibly happen. Now, Mr. Frank, if you will just direct your attention to the screen here, I'm going to show you a number of properties that is just within your own state, around the same time period, if you could even be bothered to find this stuff out for yourself, which you could if you're lazy ass to get yourself out to the library now and then. Mr. Carnegie set up a lovely free one down the road in a building much like S1, okay? Well, now, look at her. There's more busted-ass barns and old demolition-style derby homes. And you did nothing about it. You just hopped that damn fan talking about racing the speedboat. That's bullshit. I'm done. Uh, take a note. Frank Johnson, ex-senator, probably dead 100 years ago. Idiot. Thank you. It's forever on the record, Frank. <laughs> you hear that? It's forever on the record, bro. There's no, you can't go back in and undo that, dude. You messed up, bro. You messed up, dude. I don't remember seeing half these pictures I'm skimming through. Did someone cheat me out of my own... We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it later. Fuck. Anyway, where were we? Frank Johnson, that's right. <laughs> One time Frank Johnson came to my house and... No, no, he didn't. He was never there. Never fucking happened. So, anyway, moving on. Now it looks like we reached the path of the journey where I say, Oh, look, yeah, it looks like we have an obstacle in the path. It appears to have, of course, examination appears to be a train track. But all the next adventure of our journey must be involved on a train. Oh, yes, and so, due to this, I am now forced to break up the monogamy of the flow. What the fuck am I? Here we have a warehouse. Important. Completely irrelevant. Overexplored. Run of the mill. Look how the center blocks just crack. The bricks don't do that, do they? No, they don't. What do we got here? Besides a failure to communicate. Ah, oh, yes, the Benicia Arsenal, the barracks, were still there. Everything's still an arsenal. As it should be. Can never have enough arson. That's not what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Built by the army. Allegedly built an attractive housing compound. I I beg to differ. What do you guys think? Things looking good? Hey, fuck you. Okay, cool. Fuck you, old man. Nice, very nice. You know, I'm at a weird age where I can beat up you and then your dad and feel totally fine with it. Totally fine with it. So keep talking, dude. And we have degraded to a point where we are having imaginary insult wars. House. Now this guard house, we are... Not only does boldly announce what it is on the front, in saucy tones, guardhouse. Ooh. And what exactly are you guarding, sir? Well, it's not a secret, but I'd have to kill you if I told you. It's not a secret club, it's a joint to find out how we'd, what we do. My guard. I'll tell you what the guardhouse is guarding. This guardhouse that was constructed in 1872, no one knows who the architect was. This building was an attempt to combine two very different functions in one structure, which had never been done before. The engine house required a large space. The guardhouse, a series of small cells. It's not known why the two were incorporated into one project. Wait, you just told us. Hold on. This building was an attempt to combine two very different functions in one structure. It is not known why the two were incorporated into one project. <laughs> but the result nonetheless is a successful composition in which each part is completely separate, but the two function as a single visual unit, with the guardhouse forming the front and the engine house the rear. The guardhouse contained a prison composed of four cells. Two solitary, a dark cell, and another cell containing the water closet, in addition to a space that served presumably as an office and a guard's quarters. Or maybe it was something else that got buried in the dirt and then you just named the top guardhouse. In any case, the structure is notable for its elaborate ventilation system. Because the cells received no light and less air, a flue 
from each cell was carried up in the rafter. It was assumed that if the main fire were kept lit, this would provide a continual pool of air out of the chimney, which is why, in 1915, they removed the chimney entirely to completely torpedo that project. Nothing about this makes sense. This does. Well, whoever you are, go ahead and keep guarding, I suppose. Now, this bad boy is the Powder Magazine, constructed in 1857, a permanent masonry magazine. In the report of the Secretary for War for 1858, the commanding officer of the arsenal wrote, One stone fireproof magazine, erected, covered by stone, groined arches, and slate roof, and capable of containing 3,000 barrels of powder. Not now, kitten, I'm changing the world! Well, at least I'm suffering from the delusions of grandeur. One of the two looks to me more like a cistern, personally, where water would be stored, but what do I know? You? No, nothing, John Snow. Nothing in your world ain't go down now. I know it's a bullet. <laughs> I'll prove it later in the cave. More of the Bernicia arsenal, which never seems to end. Now, these buildings were constructed separately in 1876, 77, and 1884. We are told. Uh, but they look alike. Well, no one knows who built them. So... While there's a number of drawings available relating to the shops in the National Archives, the Cartographic Division, Record Group 156, if you're interested, unfortunately, many of these drawings are difficult to identify. But the large, consistent set of drawings made for building number 55, two years before the building was built, was built. There's a smaller set of drawings that was 1875, which is uh, made in 1877, and the drawings for the third one are undated. No one knows their true intention, or, or who drew them in the first place, or who built them in the first place. Hell, we don't know jack shit about these buildings. But they have extensive additions. We know that, because we did them ourselves. Brick and stone, that's all we can say for sure. There's a basement and a concrete stairway. So nobody, nobody knows. And what a dream. What a strange, strange dream. To find California in these days of emptiness would be really, truly, very much like paradise. Probably put it second to if Florida were empty. Now we're here at the church. My God. You, it, it, it's like you guys have money. Like, how could you even build this? It's like you guys are rich. Thank you, Jesus. Woo!